I received this email. It said, I downloaded some module or some code, but it doesn't work. There's no GitHub repository or documentation, and I think it's malicious. So I've gone ahead and moved this into my Flare virtual machine, and this is Python code. If you weren't able to tell, hey, we're going to use the import syntax and then run certain functions and methods to do specific things. However, a lot of this is obviously obfuscated. It is, of course, gzip data that is marshaled and then loaded and then executed, but there's a whole lot of noise here. There are a couple of interesting things. I do like the fact that they use the os.system method here to install everything that they would need as other dependencies that aren't built in before it goes ahead and imports those all. I do want to go ahead and clean this up though. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save this into a cleaned.py file and each of the semicolons for this import statement. And with that, we could replace this. We probably don't need to end up installing all these things because we don't want to detonate this on our own machine. But note that, yes, the indentation did not persist through the email. So another import statement and then the exec statement all the way at the end there. And then finally, for the accept clause at the very, very bottom of the file, we will do nothing with a simple pass statement. So with that, Ultimately, this is the trigger, but now we want to kind of clean up and see what is it actually trying to execute. So we need to go see what is passed into this execute function. The way we could do that is by simply changing it to a print function, but let me change this to another file for us to be able to kind of dynamically just run and play with. I'll call this a stage1.py, and I'll try to just probably remove all the other crap that we don't need right now and don't have installed. Uh, so let me go ahead and move my try statement. I'll remove the accept statement, and I'll change this exec into a print, and let's see if we could actually get this spat out to us. I'll go ahead and open up my terminal. I believe that should just be cmd or commander here in flare that i will move into the desktop i do believe i can just run python like that can i not i can okay cool so let's try and run python with our stage one dot pi and it's spitting it all out kind of a bummer bad arguments to internal function what did you try to do all right, I don't seem to be having any success in getting this to marshall.load's uh, function call to succeed with any of my virtual machines. However, it does work on my host. So, hey, I guess we're playing with fire a little bit, living on the edge here, but you know what? Uh, that's A-OK. -okay. So I do have the test1.python script just printing out everything as we saw just a moment ago. If I go ahead and run this, it does give us a actual code object. So it does return something, and interestingly enough, it actually tells me this is file pyfuscate. So I'm curious what that might be. We could do some Googling and some research super duper quick, but ultimately I wanna learn how can I pull out the source code from this file. So I am Googling around online. Looks like I could try to do this with the inspect module and library with get source. Uh, let's see if that will work here for us. I'm not sure if it will, but it's worth a try. Let's go ahead and import inspect. And let's say that this is actually the code that ran. I'll go ahead and move that and I'll turn off word wrap so we could actually see this code here. Now what I want to do is I want to do inspect.getSource on that ran variable. And let's say, I don't know, source can equal this. Let's try and print that out in case we are able to see it with that nice and easy win. Let's try and run that one more time. And it says error source code not available. Super lame. Um, what else could we do? But it does tell me that it is Pyfuscate, and that is something we could try to Google and research and go find. And I do see one on GitHub that has the same sort of style and structure, capital PY, capital F, and then a hyphen in between them. And that is apparently a program that allows you to obfuscate Python programs. Here is the GitHub repository, and they have a nice little animated demonstration here. There is the tool, supposedly, and if we just kind of watch them doing this thing here, what they end up doing is passing in their program with an output file. Oh, and it looks like they actually attack S for strength. Oh, it's how many times it's going to end up encoding it. Okay, so what does that actually do? When they end up returning it out, it's, oh, looks exactly like what we have. Okay, so that must be it. What do they do here? Usage is just as we expect. Um, let's go see how they do this. Regular imports, lots of pretty pen ASCII stuff. Not important, doesn't matter. Here's the encode function, okay. Uh, so, random choice of a mode. Marshall encoded is exactly as we saw with the pyfuscate name. 
executable compiled code object. And then they grab the method that they chose. If it is been ASCII, they use a specific kind. Otherwise, they just go ahead and compress it as they did and then build up the new code for the portion that matters. Okay. But because this has a strength argument, it ends up being uh, repeatedly obfuscated. 100 recommended? Oh, they do this like over and over and over again? Here, oh, nice little update functionality here, but strength, yeah, that is gonna be a loop and it keeps doing this over and over and over again. Well, what we could do is try to actually maybe like decompile get the disassembly of all the raw Python byte codes. Like if I did dis dot dis of our ran, um, will that print out what we're actually supposed to see here? Oh yeah, okay, cool. So if folks aren't familiar, these are the assembly or like the instructions for the C Python virtual machine that does specific things when Python code is executed. Uh, you'll note that there is a whole lot of other random bytes here at the top because that's going to end up being the next layer that is passed in to what we want to unravel. Let me see if I can get to the very top of this. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Oh, okay. I thought I saw a break somewhere. Yeah, here it is. So notice if I go to the very top of me trying to run this as we disassemble or run dis on this code, we end up importing Marshall. We end up importing LZMA. And all this is a lot easier to read than regular like assembly, correct? So import all these, store them as what they are. And ultimately when we want to start to execute something, we end up loading that built-in exec function. And of course taking marshall.loads and LZMA decompress. And with that, we basically know what we're gonna end up carving out for the next layer here. So that is kind of worthwhile. I wonder if we could script this and try to automate or unravel what it did when it tried to obfuscate it. If we just keep decompressing it and pulling apart the layers here. Let's see if we could try that. Let's uh, print out our disassembly and let's split on our exec function, correct? Oh, it does not return anything? What does that do? Maybe I can pass this as a bytecode object and then run dis on that, maybe? Oh, but it might have exec, of course, yet again inside the innermost one. So I think we need to slice it from there to there. And that way we can get all of these and then we'll end up kind of carving that back together. So let's do exec dot join all of that. So let's put this in a try and accept. Okay, so now we want to take that new code, split it on load const. Okay, that is the bytes. Okay, so we need every line that has a load name. Oh God, oh God. Okay, so now I think I've carved out uh, the next line of data. Now I just kind of need to safely eval that. Oh yeah, it seemed to work. I mean, I, I guess if I'm just trusting my eval, which seems like a bad idea, but it will break if something's wrong. So yeah, it seems to be carving it out. I mean, we can just try to print out each command as it comes. Okay, so it does seem to do it differently each time. Like I have new values after each one. So we could try to do this 10 times, seemingly pouring out new data, go to 100. And then we get to something. I don't know what count that is. We get to 99 and that's it. And that's the last piece. So after 99 deobfuscated portions, oh gosh, there's the real malware. Well, if we have the malware at this point, you know, we can probably just kind of save it somewhere else and try to review it. I don't know if we'll be able to get the source code in or out of that, but it's worth just trying to tee that out to like, I don't know, source, I guess. And that's a lot of stuff here, but we can at least take a look at what this thing is. Uh, so noting, hey, these are all of our import lines, nothing all that interesting. There are a lot of these kind of as we were expecting with everything else that we just saw. But we can make sense of the code here because you're importing all these things. You can see which is import name, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately we end up setting some variables with store name to be able to retrieve a environment variables with the OS library. And all of these are kind of their own individual lines where we're creating a list of passwords, presumably with pass W. And ooh, okay, we have a Discord webhook already. And this is probably going to be a uh, Discord token stealer 
as we would expect. Yeah, okay, some constants here. Uh, black cap inject URL with a GitHub user. And there we go. <laughs> I don't know what uh, this fella is. Let's take a look at their repositories though, because who, okay, here's black cap inject, discord injection for track all actions like changing password, credit card ad and PayPal. I actually work on the black cap grabber in Python. Ooh, okay. Let's take a look at that. Here's the grabber. I'm just presuming the grabber is going to be the source code to what we're looking at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Powerful, fully detectable token, consider yada, yada, yada. And cutesy, here is their black cap, fully undetectable thing. Oh, they have a Discord. Totally gonna join their Discord. <laughs> Purely educational sense, of course, of course. Obviously, as features. Okay, you enter your own webhook, so anyone else can kind of grab information. Um, oh man, I wish I would be able to see the Discord server that they're funneling that webhook into. But, obfuscation.py, this is the exact same code as the freaking pyfuscate. It's just, it's someone else's repository that he just put in here. Like literally, you know, pyfuscate with the hyphen. It's still <laughs> the exact same code, just slapped into his repo. Well, we were able to like reverse that or at least dig it down to the actual main.py. And this should be, yeah, these are all the imports that we just saw. These are all the disassembly that we just saw. And here are the local roaming and temp things that we just kind of saw in the Python bytecode. But ultimately we want to see how is this thing made in its original source code. So they have a configuration file with the black cap inject URL, your webhook. Hang on, before we go any further, let me get a quick word from today's sponsor. I'll be honest, I write bad code. Even though I try to hunt for vulnerabilities and lots of other software, I still have vulnerabilities even in my own projects. Everyone does. And that's why I use Sneak to scan for vulnerabilities in code, dependencies, containers, and configuration files. And Sneak helps find and fix those vulnerabilities in real time. You can try it and see for yourself. You can sign up for free with my link below, import your repositories, and sit back and let Sneak do the work for you. It'll find the flaws and vulnerabilities in your own applications. Check out this prototype pollution vulnerability that Sneak uncovered. We can see more details about the code path that introduced this vulnerability and even learn more about this kind of vulnerability or any others if you check out the Sneak Learn Lesson. I've referenced the Sneak Learn Lessons and their vulnerability database a ton, especially in assessments and penetration testing and even during Capture the Flag competitions. From there, you can see an explanation of the flaw, proof of concept exploit code and attack demonstrations, and most importantly, how to mitigate this vulnerability. But the best part? Sneak helps you fix this vulnerability with a single click. It'll automatically open a pull request so you can just merge and move on. So seriously, check out Sneak. It's crazy how many vulnerabilities could be affecting your projects and you don't even realize. Take advantage of their resources and learning material and learn all about the different vulnerabilities out there. It's completely free and you can sign up right now with my link in the video description. Huge thanks to Sneak for sponsoring this video. Hide script, ping enabled. Okay, so they can figure this, presumably. And yeah, all the things in ours, our in fact, filled in. So someone else has put this here. And they also have Bitcoin addresses and Ethereum bit addresses that have been probably being used to replace stuff. Address replacer, yes. So it is trying to replace cryptocurrency addresses in the clipboard. There's a lot here. How recent has this stuff been used? Okay, so still getting hits. Not a lot. About four hundred dollars in Bitcoin, a couple days. Well, wait a second. This goes back a long time. Oh, and this is a list of blocked programs or ones that it'll just try and kill right out of the gate. Yeah. So if any of these things are running, what does it do? BLL list. It kills them. Yeah, it kills all the processes. Info stealer. Getting just some random stuff with PowerShell. Oh, are these getting IP address? Of course. IP address, of course. Ooh, even the Google Maps location. This is the code and functionality to be able to swap in in your clipboard. Whenever you copy and paste a crypto address to be able to send something to it, it'll go ahead and replace it with the actual attacker's addresses so that you don't realize that you're accidentally sending them money and not the person you thought you were sending it to. Here is the black cape initial funk I'm gonna be assuming. Yep, goes ahead and grabs API, your webhook, ping type, everything that it's already retrieved out of the configuration file. 
add some persistence mechanisms and usual startups, hide the window, and whoa, here are a lot of uh, synchronous functions to be able to try and steal and scratch, grab some specific tokens. Tries to do some anti-VM protections. Hey, if it's in a debugger, then try to bail out, steal the screen, info, torkens, Minecraft, Roblox. Interesting that it has some bypass token protector, Discord token protector, where it ends up just trying to remove the specific files that come with that tool and then manipulating the configuration file to be like, hey, this hacker was here or whatever. <laughs> oh, same thing with better Discord. Nice. Holy cow, look at that steal token function. A whole lot of these where they're just grabbing the specific path for the application data and then adding in where it might be hosting a lot of those tokens, local storage, cache, etc. Browser history, browser cache, browser passwords. Goodness. Okay, so here are the embeds that are going into the Discord webhook. We end up taking the icons, author names, adding everything and exfiltrating it to that computer name windows key disk storage tokens that it was able to steal and then it uploads the file for everything that it was able to put together there's a really interesting section here on the no debugging class uh and determining whether or not it is inside of a virtual machine or some sort of sandbox like it has different usernames listed with some random ones alongside a hey, specific computer name values that could potentially be i don't know maybe an indicator that it is a sandbox or some strange way that, hey, you've got a deny list here. Do not run or detonate if you match any of these hardware IDs or the PC values, even IP addresses, kind of strange. And of course, hey, some specific paths, if they exist, then it just doesn't end up firing. It just, hey, turns itself off. Same thing with even registry keys. Look, if you look like you are inside of a virtual machine, given the disk enum values, if it's a VMware or VBox, then it just bails out. This is a very, very long file. I don't want to bore you with all of it, but there are pieces to it. I guess ultimately... We have found what this thing is, but now I'm curious, hey, what could we do with that Discord webhook? Well, there's not a whole lot more we can do with the webhook. It's not like we could actually track down, hey, what server is it joined to? Or are we able to hook into any of the messages that are sent to it? We can at least spam the webhook and try to send a whole load of data. I know... I, I'm using this online resource because I didn't build one on my own, but I can see that it's working because I have spammed a webhook that I created, and now I think I, I, I can't do anything. Discord is not letting me do anything. If I try to delete anything, it's not letting it happen. <laughs> I've even tried to delete the server, uh, but once I enter my auth code, it still won't let me do it because I'm breaking Discord. Whoops. <laughs> All right, so for the icon, I'm gonna use the uh, troll face from Wikipedia, that fella there. Uh, I do wanna make sure that I am using the genuine actual adversary's webhook. We'll just put the bot username as lol skid get wrecked. How about that? Um, it's doing its thing. It's just doing its thing real. The best that it can, I think. <laughs> All right, so bear in mind, there's no way to know whether or not that actually got there. That's no way to know it actually worked, but it's a little bit of fun. I don't know. Hopefully it breaks their Discord account just as much as it did mine. All right, well, I'm going to report this thing. <laughs> and report malware. This user hosts Discord stealers. Okay, report. There you go. All done. With that, there's not a whole lot left to do. We reversed the malware, got to find the original Discord token stealer, and we spammed the webhook and reported that original malware author creator. Now, that's not to say that is the operator for the webhook that we saw that could very well be different entities, but all around, hey, probably bad stuff that shouldn't be out there. With that, I'm done rambling. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.